Good morning, everybody. What a great time of worship. That song, Great Are You, Lord, right? I mean, that is just, those are powerful words. Uh, Good to see everybody back. I hope you all had a good vacation last week. I see a bunch of you that weren't able to make it last week. Uh, I'm glad to see you back. But one of the things we did, one of the things my family did, was that we, we recently watched The Wizard of Oz. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie. It's an old movie. Probably most of the people in this room have seen it, but it's a classic, right? But we wanted to show my daughter. My daughter's eight years old, and she had never seen it, and so we played the movie for her, one of my favorites, and she was not impressed, right? Halfway into the movie, she says, Daddy, I'm scared. I don't want to watch this movie anymore. So, you know, I shut it off. I don't want her to be scared. Well, come to find out later on, she tells me, I just told you I was scared because I was so bored. I wanted to watch something else, so you turn it off. Right? Dirty little savage. Right? So she got her way. But it's a great movie, right? You have Dorothy and her dog Toto. You have the scarecrow and the tin man. And you have the cowardly lying. And they're on a quest to go see the Wizard of Oz. They all have these desires that will make them happy. And they want to present them to the wizard, right? And ask him to fulfill these desires. And so they do that. They come before the wizard. And he's this, this floating head. He's scary and terrifying, right? And so they present their request before the wizard. And he says, I will grant them, but I want you to do one thing. I want you to go get the the broomstick of the wicked witch, and I want you to bring it back to me. And so they have no choice but to go and bring this broomstick. So against all odds, they are able to accomplish this. They grab the broomstick, they bring it back to him, and what they find is a reluctant wizard unwilling to do what he said he was going to do. He says, I come back tomorrow. And they're frustrated. They're upset. They did this thing that they were supposed to do, and now he's not fulfilling his part of the bargain. Well, just then, uh, Dorothy's little dog, Toto, jumps out of her arms, runs. There's this curtained room over to the side. He runs over. He pulls back the curtain on this little room, and there's this frightened little old man turning, turning gears and speaking into a speaker and controlling the smoke. He is the great and powerful wizard. There is no great and powerful wizard. He is it. And then you get that famous line. He speaks into the microphone. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Right? It's, it's that, that scene. The message comes through, right? Things are not always what they seem. People are not always what they appear to be. And that line, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. A large section of our culture today, that's their attitude. That's their motto. That's what they would say. If anyone is bold enough and brave enough to stand up and maybe pull back the curtain on moral issues and maybe point and ask questions, you'll be quickly rebuked and asked to please shut that curtain. And the temptation is great, right? The temptation is great to just shut the curtain, to just go along to get along, and to compromise with the culture. We're all tempted by that day after day. So in our passage today in Revelation 17, if you have your Bible, we're still going to be in the book of Revelation. You can go ahead and open up to the 17th chapter. But in our chapter today, we're going to see the curtain pulled back, so to speak, to reveal all the forces at work behind all the attractions and allurements that the world has to offer. That's what we're going to see in chapter 17. It has been an interesting week for me diving into this book and diving into this chapter specifically. And what you see is the curtain pulled back, and we get a view at the forces at work behind the attractions, allurements, and temptations of the world. So let's jump right into chapter 17. Let's look at verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. What a powerful, powerful picture. And so what happens here is the angel takes John and he pulls back the curtain for him to reveal what's really going on in the spiritual realm, to reveal to him the sources of the influence 
of the world systems, right? Th- those world systems that set themselves against God and demand to be worshipped. And what does he see? What is the picture he sees? He sees a great prostitute who has influence over the peoples, nations, multitudes, and languages of the earth. When it says that she sits on many waters, that's what it means. That term, she sits on many waters, we're going to find out later in the chapter. They explain it. We don't have to guess. The many waters means that she has global influence, the great prostitute does, over multitudes, language, languages, nations, and peoples. So the kings of the earth, the people of the earth are all wrapped up with her in immorality and drunk with sexual immorality with this great prostitute who has influence over the whole world. Now, outwardly, as we look at her, she is very, very attractive, very alluring, very tempting, right? She's clothed in the, in the color of royalty. She's dressed in purple and scarlet. She's covered in gold and jewels and pearls. And like a prostitute, she offers herself to anyone willing to pay her fee. This woman, we find out, is Babylon the Great, and she represents all the sexual immorality, all the filthiness, all the abominations in the world from the beginning of time until now. She is the source of them. That's why she's called the mother of these things. She's called the mother, the, the, the mother of prostitutes, the mother of abominations. She is the source. And she feeds on and is, is intoxicated by the blood of God's people, by the death of God's people. That's what, that's what nourishes her. That's what feeds her. That's what energizes her. And she is riding on a beast with seven heads and ten horns that is covered in blasphemous names. It's a crazy picture. But John, at this time, at this place, John knew what this meant for him and his people. At this time, John and his people were under the thumb of Rome. They were under the thumb, under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And for them, this was a picture of this, right? Because Rome was a very oppressive power who demanded worship. Rome was a place of luxury. It was a place of great power, but it was also a place of corruption. The Roman emperors at this time that John was John was writing this. He was receiving this vision. They were in charge. The Roman emperors gave themselves names like Lord, Savior, right? And they demanded to be worshipped. They demanded worship. And they didn't care about, they didn't care if you were a Christian. They didn't care if you wanted to worship Jesus. They were just fine with that. Jesus was just one more God to be worshipped. But what they did care about, what they did demand, was that you would bow the knee to Caesar and you will say Caesar is Lord. And if you would not do that, you would be thrown to the lions, you would be tortured. It would not be a good thing for you to not do that. And so Christians found themselves in a tough spot. Do you stand against the mighty forces of Rome and be destroyed? Or do you bow the knee and commit idolatry? Right? And so you can imagine the temptation for Christians to look at the massive Roman Empire, its force, its influence, its attractiveness, right? It was attractive, but it also had great power. You can imagine the temptation there to crumble before it, being willing to sacrifice your, your beliefs and, and your testimony, being willing to sacrifice anything in order to save your own skin, to grow wealthy, to be protected, to have safety. You can imagine that, attractive would be, that attraction would be pretty strong. And many Christians at this time fell. Many Christians at this time who loved the world more than they loved the Lord, this is exactly what they did. They bowed the knee to Caesar, and they said, Caesar is Lord. And many Christians still do that today. Many Christians still do that today. Because, see, this isn't just about Rome during the first century. Not at all. This is a picture of what is happening today. This is a picture of what has happened since the beginning of time. This is a picture of what will happen until the end of time. The seductive, alluring temptations of the world system and all that's wrapped up in them is in the world today and continues in the world today and will continue until Jesus comes back and he puts it into these things. And we're going to see what that looks like in this next section. Let's look at verse 7. This is what John says when he sees the prostitute, he sees the beast, he sees all these crazy things. This is what he says. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life 
from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So John sees the corrupt world system personified in this great harlot, this mother of prostitutes, this attractive woman, and he's amazed. He sees what God's people have to stand against. He sees the temptations in the world, and he realizes God's people have to stand against this woman, this attractiveness. The sea of culture, the rush of people are all going to this woman. She's attractive, she's desirable, and culture is just going that way. And John realizes Christians have to stand and go the opposite way, against the flow, against culture. Not only that, but she's riding on a beast. She's riding on the beast that seems all-powerful and enforces her will to be done at all times. And John is just amazed. He marvels. And so at this point, the angel tells him, explains to him the mystery. And this is what he says. He says, John, he says, don't marvel at what you see. Because there's going to be people who marvel at the beast, but the people who marvel at the beast are going to be the unbelievers in the world when he comes back. They are going to marvel. And the reason they're going to marvel is because he, what, he is, he was, and he is not, and he is to come. Right? Does that language sound familiar? He was and is not and is to come. That's the same description John gave, Jesus gave of himself in the beginning of Revelation chapter 1. He who was and who is and who is to come. See, this beast is a false Christ. He's a fake Christ. He's a knockoff. And there's two little words in there that, you, that, that give him away. It says about him, who was and is not and who is to come. Jesus is who was and is and who is to come. Jesus is never not. He always is. He always has been. He always will be. There's always a thing about a fake. There's always a thing about a counterfeit that gives it away. Someone with a trained eye can spot a fake, can spot a counterfeit, because there's always that thing that will give it away. Maybe you've heard this before, but you know how bank tellers spend so much time with money that when a, a counterfeit bill crosses their path, goes into their hands, they can immediately tell it's counterfeit. And the reason why is because they have spent so much time with the real thing that when the fake thing comes... You know, maybe it's a little bigger, maybe it's a little smaller, maybe the paper isn't quite right, maybe the ink isn't quite the right color. They immediately spot it and they recognize it as a fake. The same thing is true for believers. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more time we handle Jesus, the more time we spend with the real thing. When the fake comes on the scene, the fake beast, the fake Messiah, the face, fake Christ comes on the scene, believers will not recognize, will, will know that he is not. They will know that he's fake and they'll recognize that. Now, this talk about seven kings, we're going to touch briefly on it. So it talks about seven kings. What this is basically saying, what this is basically illustrating is that the time for the beast is short. He says, right, the, the clock is running out on the beast. There are seven kings. Five have fallen, right? Five have already dead. Five kingdoms are done. Five kingdoms have passed. That's it. That's over. One is... John would recognize that as the king, the kingdom that's in power when John's receiving this revelation. One is to come, maybe our day, I don't know when, but one is to come. And then after that, the end comes, and that's when the beast comes. And he will come for a short time, a short time. Now, we looked at last week, when we were in Revelation 12, remember we looked at how Jesus crushed the head of the serpent on the cross. At the resurrection and the ascension, uh, and the ascension of Jesus Christ, he crushed the head of the serpent. Satan is a defeated foe. He was cast out of heaven to the earth, but he's still dangerous. We're told in Scripture that he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So yes, his time is short, but Christians still will face persecution, still will face suffering in this world 
until the end, until Jesus comes back. And then also in this section, we see the assault on the land by the kings of the earth and the people of the earth. All the dark forces of the earth have gathered together against Jesus. All those who have paid the fee of the prostitute, all those who have worshipped the beast, all those who have sold their soul for the comforts and pleasures and wealth and power that the beast and the, and the prostitute offer. They all come to attack Christ and his people. They gather together to, to destroy Christ, right? This mighty throng, this, this power of people, and they don't realize they're gathering together for their own death, right? They are destroyed. They're gathering together for their own destruction because he is king of kings and lord of lords, and that means kings pagans, kings of, of wicked and evil people as well, and they cannot stand against him. And then in the, one of the most understated, underwhelming sentences in all of scripture, you, there's this big battle coming, right? You're ready to, to hear the details of this great battle. Armies are lining up against, against Jesus and his followers. We're with him and the, the battle lines are drawn and, and the big battle's about to take place. And this is what it says. And the lamb will conquer them. And that's it. It's over with. It's like, man, I want more. It's like, do you remember that, that scene in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Old, another old classic movie, right? Indiana Jones is running through the streets of Cairo. He's, he's running away from enemies. He's beating them up one after another. You know, he just can't stop this guy. He finally runs into a crowd and he's stopped by the crowd and everybody turns and look and the crowd parts. And there's this huge swordsman in front of him right, all dressed in all of his garb. He whips out his sword. He starts doing all this fancy sword work. You know it's going to be a great battle. You know it's going to be an awesome battle. You can't wait to see it. And what does Indiana Jones do? He pulls out his gun and shoots him, and it's over. You know, just like nonchalantly, like that, and he just walks away. It, it's, and that's what we have here, right? It's kind of just like this battle. You're ready to see this great battle. And, oh, yeah, and the lamb overcomes them. No big deal. Thankfully, for those of us who want more details, we get a fuller picture of this in Revelation chapter 19. Let me read you real quickly what it says in Revelation 19 about this final battle. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. That's us. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So this picture of this final battle that is to come, Jesus is victorious, we are there with him, but... All the evil empires that have existed for all time, all the evil empires that have, that have hated Jesus, that have hated God, that have raised their fists and shook their fists at God, they have all pointed to this battle. That is, what this, that is what every evil empire that has ever existed pointed to. This is what Dennis Johnson says, this small quote. This is what he says. At its root, every pagan world empire is another incarnation of the same satanic spirit that will reach full intensity just before it shatters, before the glory of the Lamb and goes to destruction. Let me read that one more time. At its root, every pagan world empire is another incarnation of the same satanic spirit that will reach full intensity just before it shatters, before the glory of the Lamb and goes to destruction. All evil empires that have ever existed are driven by the same satanic spirit that we see right here. And they're still present in our world today. Let's look at these last few verses of this chapter, chapter 15. And the angel said to me, right, we're back in Revelation. The angel says to John, and the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of all the earth. So we see here the great prostitute who controls all the world's people with seduction and prosperity, who rides the beast, she becomes the beast's first victim. Isn't that crazy? 
evil destroying evil. She becomes his first victim. Evil has received what it's sown, right? It has sown evil, it has reaped evil. And there's just something about evil that there's a corrosive, destructive nature to it that eventually it will destroy itself. And that's exactly what happens here. Satan turns on Satan and destroys himself. And this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. Do you remember he's healing, he's casting out demons, he's doing miracles, the scribes come and what do they say to Jesus? Uh, He casts out Satan by the power of Satan. Listen to what Jesus said to them. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he, he cannot stand. But it's coming at an end. But it's coming to an end. So this is the beginning of the end for Satan. He's divided against himself. He's begun destroying himself. It's the beginning of the end. And we read that that's going to happen because this is what God has ordained to happen. See, the powers of evil, what we need to take away from this, what we need to understand from this passage, the powers of evil serve the purposes of God. They're at his pleasure. They do what he wants as long as he wants them to do it. There's not two equal powers here. Okay, there's not God against Satan and maybe God will hang on and win. No, no, no. Satan and his followers will only be around as long as God needs them to be. As soon as he's done with them, they are done. That is it, and not a minute more. And it, but until that time, until that final battle, until they are destroyed, we will continue to face temptations in this world. We will continue, they will continue to fight against us. Those, those attractive allurements will continue to tempt us. Let me shed a light. Let me shine a light. When you shine a light on things, what happens? It loses its power. Let me shine a light on what the beast and the prostitute offer us. Each and every one of us in this room are tempted and attracted by one of these five things. And this is what they offer. Pleasures. Pleasures, right? My life was one filled with a pursuit of pleasures for many years of my life. But that's what the beast and the prostitute offer. Pleasures. Nothing wrong with pleasures. But the ones that they offer are cheap knockoffs. They're temporary. They're fake. They're counterfeit like everything else that they do. The pleasures they offer are temporary. Once you pass from this earth, if you have made pleasure your God, there are no more pleasures to be had. Who cares about pleasures in the, ha- in the past? I want, I want ones in the future, you know? And for those who have made pleasure their God and worship pleasure instead of God, there are no pleasures in the future. It's temporary. So that's number one. Second is wealth. Right? Nothing, nothing wrong with money and wealth. But if wealth and money is your God, I don't care how much money you have. When you leave this earth, guess what? It's all staying here. You ain't taking any of it. Right? That's what they offer, though. They offer temporary wealth. Third thing, reputation. Right? Maybe you want a good reputation. And what the beast and the prophet prostitute offer you, the way that you keep a good reputation is you compromise with the world, right? You go where the world goes. You stick your, you lick your finger, you stick it up in the air, see which way is the wind blowing, you jump out in front of the parade and, and, you know, you just, that way you get a good reputation. People like you, they cheer you, you like what other people like. That's what the world offers. That's a reputation that the beast and the prostitute offer us. The fourth thing is safety. A lot of people worship safety. They want safety, right? They just want to be secure. Nothing wrong with that. But the safety and security that the prostitute and the beast offer is temporary. If you bow the knee to what the world bows the knee to in order to keep from persecution, you might be safe for a little while. But guess what? Tomorrow it's going to be something else and something else and something else. You're going to have to bow, 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 bow over and over and over. And when you finally die not many years from now, You are not going to be safe and secure. It's temporary. It is false. It is fake. It is counterfeit. And the fifth and final thing, the beast and the false prophet offer, or the beast and the the prostitute offer, is power. Some people just want power, right? Nothing wrong with power. But let's just imagine for a second, somehow, 
you were able to become in charge of the whole world. Everything in the world was under your domain. Every street, every bank, every person, every country, everything was all in your power. And somehow you had enough power within you, so you had enough strength of will to will yourself to live for 150 years, let's just say. And you enjoyed that power, every last drop of it, for 150 years. After 150 years and you die, that power does not go with you. It stays right here. It's temporary. It is not permanent. What did Jesus say? He said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing. So outwardly, what the world has to offer is very attractive. It's very luring. It can be intoxicating, right? You can be tempted to marvel at what the world offers. And the temptation to compromise with the world and the world system is very powerful. It's very seductive. And if we're not careful, we'll fall. And if you do fall and if you do compromise, there's going to be a high price to pay. And then Satan comes along. And you know what he does? He whispers in your ear. He would have you believe that these temporary pleasures that we just talked about, these five things, can not only satisfy you, which they cannot, but that there's no price to pay. He would have you believe that there is no price to pay for worshiping these things instead of God. But there is. And this is exactly what he did with Jesus in the wilderness. Do you remember? Jesus is in the wilderness at the start of his, his ministry. He has fasted and prayed for 40 days. He's tired. He is hungry. Satan comes to him at his weakest moment. And what does he do? He takes him to a high place. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he tells him, I will give you all these kingdoms. They will all be yours. If what? Just bow the knee. Just bow the knee to me. Just say a little, you know, Satan is Lord. That's all I need. Just a little, just a little, little phrase, just a little something. Just say that for me. And you can have all this. No cross, no pain, no suffering, no price. It won't cost you a thing. That's a lie. It is a lie. There's always a price to pay. There is always a cost. And those under, those under Satan's spell, the prostitute and the beast, they demand loyalty and they demand worship. And those who love the world more than they love the Lord will fall. John, who's writing this, who's getting this vision, in one of his other letters, this is what he said. He said, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. So here in chapter 17, we've been given a look behind the curtain. And we've seen the immorality. We've seen the filth. We've seen the bankruptcy of idolatry, of worshiping money and material possessions instead of the Lord. And what is behind these things, we've been given a picture of what is behind these things is a, is a prostitute and a beast. One commentator called this section, the beauty and the beast. Beauty, I thought it was great. Beauty and the Beast. Just happens to be one of my wife's, well, actually it happens to be my wife's favorite movie, Beauty and the Beast. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means about why she picked me as a husband. I'm sure there's something there. I'm pretty positive it has something to, you know, to do with that movie, Beauty and the Beast. I don't know. But anyways, so anyways, in that movie, Beauty and the Beast, what happens is you have a prince who's, who's gorgeous. He, he's very handsome outside. But inwardly, he is selfish, he is self-absorbed, he is nasty, he is mean. And a lady comes across his path and puts a spell on him and transforms him. What is on the inside of him now comes on the outside. And that's why he's the beast. You see what was inside come outside. There is coming a day in this world when what is behind the curtain, when what is unseen will be seen. It will be exposed. You know, Jesus on this, when he walked this earth, when he walked on this earth, he was an ordinary guy. I don't know what picture you have of, of him in your head. Maybe you have him kind of floating along the ground with a halo over his head, just kind of floating along. But he was just an ordinary guy. There were many times in the scriptures where he would just walk into a crowd and just disappear. He, he would just blend in with everybody. 
right? He, was the, he, he came from Mary in the line of Abraham. He probably looked like the rest of their family. Isaiah said this about him. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Remember, Jesus had to be identified by a kiss in the garden by Judas because he just looked like everybody else. He was just an ordinary, regular-looking guy. But there's coming a day when what was inside of Jesus, what is inside of Jesus, will be seen by the entire world. And he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is full of grace and truth. And he is more beautiful to behold than we would have ever hoped. And guess what? Those five things that we pursue, the prostitute and the beast for, those temporary things that they offer, he offers them for real. He offers them eternally, right? Pleasures. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with pleasures. God invented, God created pleasures, but they need to be done in the right way. And we don't want pleasures that are temporary and passing. We want pleasures that are forever more. Look at what Psalm 16 says. Psalm 16 says this, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures forevermore. That's pleasure that lasts. That's the kind of pleasures that we want. We don't want to, and that's what Jesus offers, pleasures forevermore. What about wealth? Right, like I said, there is absolutely nothing wrong with wealth right? But we want wealth that lasts. Who wants wealth that is temporary? I don't. This is what Jesus said in Matthew. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You want treasure that lasts? You do good deeds and good works here on the earth, and you send those treasures ahead of you into heaven where no one can steal, where no one can take, and they are eternal and they last forever. What about the third thing? What about reputation? Right? The beast and, and the prostitute offer a reputation if you just bow your knee to what the world bows a knee to. But I would say, like the Bible says, a good reputation is to be desired. It says that in Proverbs. And what better reputation would there be to have than a son of God, than an adopted child of God, than an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ to be called a son of the king? This is what it says in Galatians. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You want a reputation that lasts? You be called a child of the king. You be called a child of God. That's what we want. That's what we truly want deep in our hearts, and that's what Jesus offers. That's what the Lord offers. What about number four, safety? The world offers that temporary safety, right? I want a safety that is permanent and lasting, a security that is permanent and lasting. And at the end of Revelation, we read the kind, that kind of security is possible. In chapter 21, we read about what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. This is what it says. But nothing unclean will enter it. Nothing unclean will enter heaven. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. You want safety and security? This is where it's found. It's only found in heaven. It is only found in heaven and is eternal. And the last one, power. Who doesn't want power? Who doesn't want to feel powerful, at least in your own body, if nothing else? Right? And not only temporarily and then die and have none, what about the power that lasts forever? After resurrection. Let's look at what Corinthians says about this. Talking about our resurrected bodies. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, our bodies, is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. You want power? You want to be powerful for all eternity? There's only one place to get that, and it's found in Jesus Christ. And he offers these things eternally. He offers these things permanently and truly. They're not cheap knockoffs. They're not counterfeits. They are the real deal. So John's message here brings us comfort, right? John's message is meant to bring Christians comfort. There's a blessing in this book. We read that last week. There's a blessing at the beginning and a blessing at the end in the book of Revelation. These words are meant to comfort the church. They're meant to comfort us, but they're also a warning. Things are not always what they seem. 
Things in this world are not always what they seem. What seems so attractive and alluring and tempting and inviting right now is one day going to be exposed for what it truly is. The curtain is going to be pulled back. And we're going to see how filthy and abominable and wicked the world system and the ways of the world are. We do not want to be associated with that. We need to be careful that we see things as they truly are now. And then also on that day, he who seemed so plain and ordinary as he walked here on this earth, just another Jewish man walking around, he will be the focus of our attention for all eternity. We will not want to take our focus off him because he's full of beauty, he's full of grace and truth, and we want to keep our eyes on him. When that curtain is pulled back, can you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for these words, Lord. We thank you for the way that you have given us a glimpse into the way that the world really works, the systems behind the things that we find as humans so attractive, so tempting, so inviting. Lord, I pray this would be a vision that we don't soon forget and that you would give us minds and hearts that, that focus on you, that focus on eternity, that remember very shortly, very shortly, the curtain is going to be pulled back and what is behind it is going to be revealed, not only in the nasty world systems, Lord, but you as well and us who have followed you, Lord, and the sufferings and the strivings and the tribulations that we have walked through, Lord, because we worship you and only you. All that will be seen and known, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this vision of the future. We thank you for this vision of heaven and this this reminder, Lord, of what's important. Lord, we love you. You are truly great and worthy of our praise, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your beauty, Lord, that will one day be revealed to us. In Jesus' name, amen.